All right. How's everybody today? Second day of the show. Still a lot of energy. I'm excited uh, just to be here. If this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. John Paul and Gregory have been great to deal with uh, since the very beginning. I was the first person in the United States to have the research grade 3D plates. That's the big plates over there. I'll give you a little history about me and ground reaction forces. I actually had my first set of force plates in 1993. I don't have a picture of them, but they're, they were only this wide and this long. So you had one under each foot and they were that high. So you can imagine how dangerous that was. Well, we didn't know. All I knew is I wanted to know where your weight was. So guess what I thought? The only thing I thought about in 1993 was that I wanted the weight on the left foot. At the end, it's the only thing I wanted. You couldn't replay it with video. It would give a live amount of weight as it changed from right foot to left foot. So I videoed that so I could frame advance it with the golfer. Pretty interesting, right? So here we are 32 years later, and this is, this is what that is. I knew what I wanted, and I knew that didn't work. In 1994, I saw my first research-grade force plates. That, those Kistler plates have been around probably 50 years, almost 60 years. So ground reaction forces are not new to the world. They were just new to golf to be able to measure. That gets me back to my beginning. I played college golf at McNeese State University, Division I. Uh, I was good enough not to get run off the team. You know, I played number four, five, six, 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 um, you know. But I made about 75% of my, my, my tournaments. And I thought that I was going to be a pro golfer. But about halfway through my college experience, I realized that's a pipe dream. But I did have two roommates win finals of PGA Tour School. So I couldn't have been, too, and I beat them every once in a while, but they were way better than me on a regular basis. So I, again, I want to be around golf. I didn't care if I was clean and tall instead of golf course. I wanted to work at a golf course. Luckily, the job when I first graduated at the club I had worked for seven years, they fired the pro. So I interviewed for the job, and at 22 years old, one month out of college, I was a head professional at a country club. But my passion was still playing and kind of teaching. I thought I knew something back then. As I tell people in the 70s, we were putting leeches on each other. We didn't know what we were doing. And I knew I wanted to get better. And everything that I knew that I tried to change, I never got any better. I still have the notebook. I need to put this in my slide presentation. I still have a notebook with nine pages of notes while I was in college, what I was working on. I've looked through that. There's not one good swing thought in nine pages. That's pretty bad. So anyway, I get my job and my first week I'm teaching an engineer, aerospace engineer. And I ask him to do something at the top of the swing and he goes, why? You know, you, you get challenged at 22, you, know, you don't know the answer, I case because I do it. Well, he said, that's not a very good reason. And he said, how do you know if I do it right? I said, well, I'm Mr. Duffy? I said, well, I got my eyes. And he shakes his head. And he says, James, never guess what you can measure. Y'all hear that all the time, don't you? I tell people I made that famous, but this man, Mr. Ray Lacombe, who's buried in Arlington Cemetery is the reason. So I went and bought a $2,800 video camera and only made $9,000 a year in salary. That's crazy what it is. And I was measuring. Problem is I didn't know what to measure. And I asked Mr. Ray, I said, but if I measure, why do you think that's so important? He says, if I hit a good shot and hit a bad shot, if you're measuring it in depth, you can, you can tell the difference why one was good and one was bad. That's all I needed to know. So this is 1982. I would say that on the, on the academic side and research side, this stuff is even older than that date. So they already knew this stuff, but I wanted it for golf. Accuracy matters for the body and the club. Me and Sean Foley, I worked a lot with Sean. Uh, when he was working with Tiger and you know when you're Sean Foley at that time everybody's trying to give you everything. The first body track that was even made they gave me and Sean Foley one. Well it was a, like a plastic bag with a wire hanging out of it. A black plastic bag with a wire hanging out of it. I'm going this is cool and you could go right left and had a little heat thing. I went man this is really cool. So I took it back to, to my, my deal and I started trying to incorporate in the lesson 
there's only one problem. You couldn't tie where the golfer was to the, the, the forces. So it basically was a nice center of pressure mat. But then again, at the time, you know, if you don't know the difference between pressure and weight and, and so forth, you know, you'd see people's pressure go left and then come back right, and you say, well, that's got to be wrong, but you didn't realize they were just almost, they were almost cartwheeling backwards and landing on their trail foot. I didn't know all this stuff. So anyway, you have to be accurate. There's research grade stuff, and then there's stuff that everybody's trying to, in every way, trying to create something that's way less expensive that they say will do the same thing. We all have to be careful about that. I'm not saying they're not innovative products because they're unbelievably innovative products, but I would go with nothing else. So I never bought any force plates until I can get dual force plates and I had software. Here comes Smart to Move. They had what I wanted. That's kind of how a golfer is and that's all the things that we've researched in this game and it's all the way around this circuit and we're talking about how the club and the ground reacts to the body today so this is this is kind of my take on some of the stuff I have 16 hours of presentation and obviously we're not going to cover all that to say a complete story of what I believe what I believe I'm not saying it's even right what I believe take 16 hours to tell the pink the whole picture think about a person in the university who wants to be you know a a uh, biomechanist of the body it's a four-year degree doctorate degree it's a lot more in depth than what I know I haven't even taken physics but I did speak in MIT three times so the impact alignment system so the impact alignment system is how the club comes into the ball we're not going to talk about that today ground reaction forces and using them can change how this club moves we're not going to talk a whole lot about that today in this I want to talk more about the pivot so it has two components, a speed generation system, which is the efficient acceleration, deceleration of body segments from proximal or distal end. Let's talk about that in easiest terms. If I had a whip in my hand, and it's just, I'm standing here with a, with a whip snock, snap, but if I laterally, linearly move the whip handle as fast as I can and stop it, it will come around and whip on it. It'll snap. If you really want it to snap, you want it to go forward, stop, and go backwards. Well, there's some of that going on in the golf swing. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Now, this isn't just a speed generation thing. It also affects how the club comes into the ball. Ground reaction forces only, only contribute a portion of the total translation and torques of the body. So what I basically mean by that, the legs aren't everything. Ground reaction forces aren't everything. We're doing stuff above the waist. You know, you know you can... You, you could swing, if somebody cut your legs off, there are people that could swing, but when they swing and swing the club, they're still gonna bounce off the ground. So even a person with no legs are gonna have some reaction into the ground. I liken ground reaction forces to a car that has a flat, and you put the, you put the jack under the car in the, in the middle of the car, and when you jack the jack up, when you start turning the thing, it'll only lift if what? The ground under is solid. If it's pudding, the jack stretches, but it, it just goes into the ground and the car don't move. And that's the, like, for instance, if you're in a fairway bunker and don't have as much traction, you can't create the ground reaction forces that you can create on one of these plates or a concrete floor. The arm swing can make up only so much for a bad pivot. So in other words, if a person has a bad pivot, the arms can still get the club to the ball, but it's so much easier to create speed with a proper pivot and create impact alignments with a proper pivot. You don't have to have a proper pivot to hit a good golf shot, but you, it's kind of, it's, it's a one-off thing. It's not very good. And obviously, as people get older and older, they can't pivot the way they used to. Force precedes motion. So I want everybody to think if there's a car here and there's someone in the back of the car, that's the rear end, that's the front, they're pushing in the golf swing laterally if there's only one person there if he pushes it he's pushing against the car but if you're videoing it as soon as he pushes the car don't move it takes it you have to have enough force to create movement so the force precedes the movement if you're changing directions of a segment the force starts 
before the segment changes direction. And we're gonna show you some, some stuff later on that's pretty cool. Gentleman sitting here, just standing here, if he's 50% left 50% right his combined vector which is what we really need to understand is if this is 100 pounds and this is 100 pounds this is 200 pounds and this is the only one from this frontal plane that matters so if he's not in motion that's going to and he's balanced that's going right through his center of mass but what would that mean if I'm going to jump up and push into the ground equally my combined vector go through my center of mass and I'll go straight up in the air but what if I push twice as hard with my left foot as my right, I'm going to torque. Because now all of a sudden, that can, if this, is, this, this arrow is gonna be twice the height of that arrow, and then that force vector is gonna be to the side of that center of mass, and it will, you will cartwheel. So we could cartwheel in either direction, but that force, when it gets on the other side, will cartwheel you. Sometimes that's an advantage and sometimes that's a disadvantage. It could be a disadvantage if a person's prone to fat shots, if you just start pouring on more and more lead side verticals because you don't think they have enough. So you better think about that golfer where they have to get positionally to push that in to still hit the ball in the ground. I cannot emphasize that enough. If they're not forward enough, because if they're back here and push into the ground with the lead side and cartwheel even further back, fat, thin, fat and thin, and if you try to get them way inside out, that's a triple shallower, they might hit the ground and then top the ball. That's how you would. If you wanted to top a ball on purpose, how would you do it? You'd push in hard with your lead side and you'd lift up, but your body would be positionally here, and your weight would be back there, your, your pressure. There's three planes of motion in the golf swing. The frontal plane is if I had, if I was washing a window like this. So what creates frontal torque? A combined vector that's to the side of my center of mass. Does this center of mass move? Yes. In the golf swing. It can be external to the body. Well, how can the heck can your center of mass be an external to your body? Well, once that club starts swinging, that's a whole different object. That could pull your center of mass away from the center of your body. And these force vectors still have to be in relation to that center of mass are still important. So that's the frontal plane. The sagittal plane is this way, a plane of glass. So again, a pure force vector through just the frontal will only give me frontal torque. A pure vertical uh, sagittal plane t force off the center of mass will make me backflip. This will make me go forward. But does it do it immediately? No. The body is not like this phone. This phone is rigid. If I push my finger up a quarter of an inch, that moves a quarter of an inch immediately. But in the body, we're made of bones, segments, muscles, not many in my case, and fat's even more porous than muscles. So it takes a little more time for that force to get to the upper torso, which the arms and the shoulders are attached to. So that ha takes time, which means if you don't put these forces into the system early enough, they are worthless. They're worthless. They're never gonna get to the upper torso and back to the club to pull on the club. And the last one is horizontal or transverse. We're not gonna talk much about that. It's how we rotate. Anybody old enough to remember Greg Norman? Well, Greg Norman didn't do it every swing, but every once in a while, his foot would slip back a lot. He never hit a good shot when his foot slipped. And they go, what about Scotty Scheffler? He does it every time. So when you change the ground reaction force of this anterior posterior, it's a miss for a guy who never does it. It's same old, same old for a guy who does it every time. So a tennis player, when they hit a tennis ball, where are they at when they contact the ball? Are they touching the ground? They already used the ground. They already used the ground. Justin Thomas was on both toes. He already used the ground and it's worked its way through his system. You're gonna find out if you get dual plates like this that most people's forces are too late. They're too low and they're too late. Means they're worthless. Basically, you're swinging with upper body if they, if they ever get to the club. So here's some graphs. These are all the smart to move graphs on the right and I'll explain how they work. On the left is the video. It was done a year ago in here and you don't get good light in here. 
but you, I highlighted the club so you'll see where the club is. The way the graphs work in Smart to Move, they're really beautiful. People who look at just numbers, I don't think they get an overall picture as well as the graphs. So when you start getting software, I'd rather you look at the graphs than the numbers. Because you know why I look at the graphs? I want to know where something's coming from and going to. A number is a piece, place, and time. You can't see acceleration with just a number, but if you see a graph, you go, oh my God, that's accelerating. At first, people get confused by the graphs and I think they make a big mistake by not using those. So, D weight, I'm gonna lie and say I'm 200 pounds. D weight is if I'm gonna jump and touch now only a net on a basketball court. I used to be able to dunk a basketball in high school. It's about 95 pounds ago, but anyway, if I'm going to jump and touch the net, I've got to squat and jump. Can I touch the net if my legs are locked? Can I move vertically? The answer is no. So what do you think if I bend my knees a lot and jump, or if I bend my knees, flex my knees in, a little and jump, which one do you think I could jump the highest? Deep flex or less flex? Less. In other words, boom is way more powerful than that. I had to be proven that because I said the same thing. So you have to flex your legs. So when you flex your legs, if I'm 200 pounds, as soon as I flex both of my legs, I'm in a free fall. So I weigh less. Well, he weighs 61% of his body weight at maximum D weight. So 61% and here comes the verticals from there. He's, he's a, a, a one out of six tour freak. You know, he's not a golfer per se. I mean, he's a golfer, but the point is, is it's maximum speed for them. We like to see about 80% of body weight at maximum D weight, and then we'll get into the other ones later. Now, the way the graphs are across, there are three colored lines. The red, if you notice the force plate here, see the red dot? If I'm hitting this way, that's my trail foot numbers is on the red, and my lead foot numbers, left foot, is on the blue. And you say, well, what's that third number? That's the total. So if you add the red and the blue equals the brown. You see where the total and the, the blue number and the brown number touch? What do you think that means? All the weight or pressure is on that left foot at that moment. And you notice that the red one's on the ground. That means there's no pressure. Okay? I want you to be able to read the graphs. So they go left to right. Then you notice that we put markers, vertical markers, at different points. The red vertical marker is where he is in the golf swing on the video. The green marker, the green marker is the top of the swing. Okay? So he reached maximum D weight before the club ever got to the back, to the top. That's early. I'm not saying it's wrong. Maybe for power generation, it needs to be there. Most people's max D weight is slightly, slightly after the top. But if you're gonna get the verticals earlier, you better get the D weight earlier. Does that make sense? So you've seen people swing at a golf club and go, they're in the D weight when they make contact. You wanna talk about, that's a good way to plow. You wanna plow the ground? Don't give yourself verticals at all. People who have chipping problems, you just need to add a little getting taller through the ball. You don't have to jump at it, but one of the people, one of the reason people hit fat shots is because they they're going this way and they're de-weighting as they're hitting the ball. That's bad news bears. So this these plates can identify all of that. Okay, so he's de-weighting before. The next one is impact, which is the black line, and the blue line is finished. So he is. You notice that brown line's the lowest it's going to be at that moment, which is before the top. Everybody get that?